Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan Barthelemy. I'm a developer relations manager at NVIDIA. And today, uh, it's my great pleasure to talk to you about one of the projects we are doing around Edge AI in Antarctica. I'm presenting on behalf of my team. So there is uh, Dr. Crystal Rendal, uh, Dr. Umar Iqbal from University of Longang, and a couple of technicians, so Douglas and, and Cameron. Before we start showing what we've done, I'd like to just say a few words about what SAFE is. SAFE stands for Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. That's a eight years research program funded by the Australian Research Council Special Research Initiatives. Um, this is all about interdisciplinary research. That is something that is put in place so that we can understand the impact of climate change in Antarctica and develop a set of policies and regulations to help mitigate those impacts. Of course, we will be doing a lot of research. There will be a lot of modeling, simulation, development of new technologies like robots, AI, ML, those kind of things. And for that, um, NVIDIA is actually the technological partner. So I'm not too sure if you know much about NVIDIA. I'm guessing you sort of do. But we do much more than just graphic cards and AI. We are basically everywhere you can accelerate scientific computations. Okay. So we've got more than 550 AI models. We've got libraries. We've got hardware. We've got software. We've got experts that are here to help support the research and the developments of any type of industrial applications as well. All right, let's go to Antarctica. And yeah. I get to start with a nice, cute pictures of Imperial penguins. That's beautiful, right? Well, probably that's one of the last pictures we can take, right? Earlier this year, we lost 10,000 of chicks from Imperial penguins. Why? Because um, simply the sea ice is melting very, very fast. It's actually six times as fast than an average year this year. So the sea ice melted too quickly, and all the chicks that didn't know how to, to dive and swim well, passed away. That's not the only matter, right? So we are losing a lot of ice, but it also impacts the vegetation. Not a lot of people know it, but there is a lot of vegetation in Antarctica along the coast, and that's mostly moss. And those moss, they are also changing. So um, they used to be green and healthy, but over the year, we can see they're changing colors. They are becoming uh, orangish or maybe a bit uh, gray. So it means they are moribund or they are becoming to die, which is a shame because they are hosting a lot of life there, and they are also uh, capturing carbon. To monitor the, the change, um, so far we need to send scientists once a year over there, and they can only stay for two to three months, only during summer. So monitoring what's happening there is quite uh, challenging. And it's not only because of the weather, but also because there is no network over there. Or you could think about satellites if you want to do some remote sensing, but you don't get the actual information on the ground. So th there are clearly a gap there to understand what's happening. And that's where um, SAFE is coming. So within SAFE, we've got a research project that is all about developing a new artificial of things sensing platform for Antarctica. The idea is to have a box that can be connected to different types of sensors that depends on what the scientific community needs, and then we'll be able to monitor um, vegetation, animal, penguins, or the, the weather. And all that data will be transferred back to Australia in real time using LoRaWAN. So those boxes have a LoRaWAN node there, and then they transfer it back to the research station um, where there is a gateway and back to Australia via a satellite link. So the end-to-end -end journey is roughly two to three minutes to get the data. Now, the actual box looks a bit like this for the moment. So you've got a set of different types of sensors. You've got weather sensors, so temperature, humidity. Um, we've got radiation sensors as well. We've got a camera, microphone, uh, some other sensors to monitor the energy exchange between the soil and the atmosphere. And everything is orchestrated with an NVIDIA Jetson. So the Jetson is a small embedded computer that can do AI on, on the edge. Once the data is processed, then it's being sent either via Wi-Fi for images or using LoRaWAN for all the um, te telemetry. 
So the goal of this work is, at the end of the four years, to have an open platform. So we'll be sharing the design, we'll be sharing the code, anyone can replicate and can improve that. It's also a small footprint. Nowadays, if you want to design a monitoring station in Antarctica, that's roughly $80,000, Australian dollar. This costs between five and 10,000, depending on the sensors that uh, you want to implement. We want to use it as a test bed to deploy new AI algorithms. Uh, we never know what needs to be monitored the, the next day or so. So we've got something that you can easily uh, convert. And we want long range communications. So that's why we stick with uh, LoRaWAN. Also because it's free. Yeah. <laughs> so building a platform like that for Antarctica has a few challenges. First of all, the obvious one, it's the Antarctic conditions. So, yep, there is not much energy that you can use over there. You've got a bit of sun for maybe three to, to four months, and then it's a lot of uh, night. You've got a lot of winds. Blizzards can be more than 200 kilometers per hour. So that will blow away anything that is not well anchored in the soil. And the temperature, when it's minus 40, minus 50, minus 60, will have a big impact on the batteries. So that's only the conditions for Antarctic. Then there is everything related to logistics. To go there, you need to work with a government agency, the, Antarctic, the Australian Antarctic Division, and there is a lot of rules. So every day they come up with a new paperwork, new things to, to fill, new, new regulations, so they want to, to know everything. Especially the batteries can be a bit of a hassle. You cannot bring lithium batteries, for instance. You need to stick with the good old AGM batteries that you are using in your cars. And then there is everything um, that we call the unknown unknowns, right? So you go there and you get stuff that you did not expect, like uh, static electricity, or the fact that the IT network is also owned by a government, meaning that uh, you can get some issues to open ports to transmit data back to, to Australia. So all those challenges, that's what we call the A factor. It's a bit like Murphy's Law. So anything that can go wrong will go wrong twice, and it's going to be very cold. Having said that, we could put some goals for the first prototype that we designed uh, this year. So the goal was to test the sensors, the electronics, the uh, radio transmission. We also went there to set up the first LoRaWAN uh, net network over there based on the Things network. And we wanted to test the range of that, that communication network. We went there also to understand the logistics to get uh, used to the people there and to identify some of the unknowns. Now for the testing location and duration, we had the opportunity to go to KC Research Station, so that's uh, 66 degrees south and we could spend six weeks over there to uh, install and play with it. So one of the first things we had to do is to install a LoRaWAN getaway. And you can see on the map uh, at the left where KC is, because that's where we deployed the, the uh, getaway there. On the right side, we started uh, to map the coverage. So when I was there, I took some spare parts that was available from the platform, I built a GPS tracker, and I started to walk around and um, took the device with me whenever we went to an expedition, so collecting most samples. Um, you might see there are a few dots there on the sea. We didn't go there swimming, of course, it's a bit too cold, but we put the tracker on a plane, and the guys were kind enough to fly it for, for a little while for us. So we ended up with a coverage of 15 kilometers. The getaway is a multi-tech one, and it's currently installed on top of a um, KC science building. So the good news is it's still on today, so it's surviving blizzards and very low temperatures as well. So thank you, multi-tech, very good stuff. Now that the platform is installed, we also have a dashboard, and we could receive data in real time. So every minute or every two minutes, we get the data points coming on the dashboard, and it's completely open for anyone to download and do their own analysis if, if they want it. Uh, we quickly built a very small model to understand the mood of the moss. So happy moss, sleepy moss, um, grumpy moss. What you can see there is actually the field of view of the platform and you have a nice time-lapse over 24 hours of what is happening. 
and below that some 3D reconstruction that we can do based on some images that th the platform is taking uh, as well. Now, we cannot always send images, especially if we rely on LoRaWAN only. Um, so we are also putting inside the platform some edge AI. So in this case, we perform some image segmentation, and we are able to identify in the image each pixel and telling whether it's a rock, a moss, if it's snow, and different types of categories. The only thing then that we need to transmit is the amount of pixels related to moss, or to healthy moss, or to, to snow. So um, five or six numbers instead of millions of pixels. At the end of the day, the, the season was quite successful. Right? Um, it's not that pretty. It's a pelican case with a couple of wires here and there. But it worked better than what we, we expected. And when I said it's not pretty, well, it's a point of view. I mean, um, it's like babies. I built that thing, so for me, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. But for the people, yeah, I understand it's a box. So the outcome is we got the electronics validated. So we know what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we got the LoRaWAN infrastructure ready to go, and anyone can use it. So it's open for anyone in the Australian um, territory to, to use. The pipeline from uh, Antarctica back to Australia is validated, so uh, it, it works. The only downside is the batteries. Even though we used big batteries, or sort of big, like 42 amps hour, it only lasted three days. So that's why we had to hook it up to the, the mains power. And also, we now understand um, how to get stuff over there, which yeah, was kind of a win. So knowing that, we are now building the second version of the prototype that, that you can see here. So the target for the longevity will be between three months and six months. And that's just continuous operation, right? So when it's winter, there's nothing to, to monitor. We'll switch it off and then on again whenever it's uh, useful. We are going to deploy it with solar panels. We are working a lot on power management and power supply, of course. So uh, we pay a lot of attention on hibernation mechanisms. And we will need to find some ways to heat the box uh, so it doesn't go too cold for, for the electronics. The next stage will be to deploy three of those platforms all around the, the Antarctic uh, territory uh, over there. So the first thing we're going to do is to be take bigger batteries. The old batteries, that was fine. I could carry the box myself. With the new one, I might need to go to the gym before I need, uh, I'll be able to, to carry those. Um, we are designing our PCBs with, with some partners. We are moving to the newer Jetson Orin Nano, which is a nice uh, system from, from NVIDIA. And we are working on the sensors as well. So what sensors we are using depend on the request from the, the safe uh, community. Extending the range uh, will be done using mesh networks. So each platform will act as a small relay so we can actually deploy those platforms further and further into Antarctica. Having said that, I've seen there are nice development with satellite transmission, so probably we'll have a look at that. Of course, that's just one prototype, and there are many applications there, so we can easily use that to monitor something else. Uh, so not only moss, but animals, for instance, like those cute Adelie penguins. Uh, we can look at the, the glacier dynamics. We can look at get, collecting more data for microclimate models. So there are many, many things that, that we can do to underst well, better understand Antarctica and the impact of climate change um, over there. Also, we are using a lot of different technologies there. Right? So we also rely on good old scientists that go on the field and use things like spoon to, to dig the, the snow and find the moss. We got some um, people that like to try the snow. We carry some quadrats to find the, the, the areas of interest. So there are many things that, that uh, we, we can play with. Um, I'll finish by acknowledging the University of, Aust uh, University of Wollongong, which is hosting the, the research project, SAFE, that is actually giving us the fund to do that. Um, NVIDIA is supporting the effort by providing technological expertise and, and hardware. And finally, the Australian Antarctic Division for providing the logistics to go there and coming back, of course. Um, so, yeah, thanks. And let me know if you've got any questions. Happy to discuss that.
Uh, yes. Okay. Can you go back uh, to the slide with uh, the application? This okay. one? Thank you. Uh, this one. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, what kind of monitoring interval do you use to monitor the images and do the segmentation? Um, so, because we had access to mains power, I was doing that every minute. Right? But, when it's going to be in full deployment, we do that once a day. And, and that's more than enough. Yeah, it guess it goes kind of slowly, so that should be enough. Yeah, that, that doesn't change that much, <laughs> that quick. Uh, Lady has a question before. Uh, how many days do the new batteries last? Like the, 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 the new stuff? batteries, if we don't change anything, that will last for two weeks. Right, so that's keeping everything the same. But of course, we are going to change a lot. So uh, polishing the integration, getting rid of the circuitry that we don't need. Now it's only based on dev kits. So we know it uses a lot of power for nothing. And we will put some uh, hibernation mechanism, so lowering the sampling rate as well. So that way we can get easily three months, which is the duration of the, the summer. But you want to get up to six months to collect data when it's a bit more darker, but not full night as well. Hi, I think the amazing presentation. Um, I think this is a big thing. It is. <laughs> what will be the next big thing? Um, so we are working with some colleagues from the Queensland University of Technology to take that platform to the next level, meaning that it will be able to orchestrate a fleet of drones that will go around and, and survey the area and take some uh, MOS samples or water quality samples and bring back to, to the IoT platform that will act as a base and send the data back. So that's, the, um, that's what we are dreaming about right now. No more questions? Well, thanks again for listening, and yeah, talk to you soon.